salty, my naughty's hit her salty. On everybody, welcome to IE Sports Radio. I'm Niners Jess, along with Ty Alston, Maddie B, and your girl Bex will be joining us shortly. We are the East Coast Red and Gold. What's going on, Faithful? Doing good. How you doing? Hello, friends. Doing well. Doing real well. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to us, the East Coast Red and Gold, on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And of course, IE Sports Radio has a ton of different social media channels, including X. Instagram, uh, Facebook, make sure you check out all of those and uh, liking and subscribing as needed. Also, a very brief reminder while I stall for time here very slowly and try to remember exactly when I added this new thing to the thing. And then I remember I found it because Planet Jerky Premium Brisket Beef Jerky is an all brisket jerky with gluten free options, no MSG, no sodium nitrate and is low in sugar and high in protein, which is a ratio that all of us want. So make sure you get some Planet uh, Planet Jerky, brisket beef jerky at planetjerky.net. It's the jerky that's on a whole other planet. They're a big time sponsor of IE Sports Radio. And of course you can make sure you can find more of us at iesportsradio.com backslash East Coast Red and Gold for all the content you could ask for. All right, awesome. So without further ado, let's bring on our special guest. We got Coach joining us. What's good, guys? What's going on, family? How y'all doing? Good. Mm -hmm. How about you? We're not right. happy, man. We're really right. good, good, man. Have, yeah. I'm humbled to be here. Thanks for having me. So what's going on, man? You guys ready to talk about some Niners? Always. Yeah. Please. Um, Always. First, Coach, you're in, uh, you're in Maryland, right? Yeah, I'm from Maryland. Yeah. So, like us what East part? Coasters, we're we're get asked PG, a lot. Richard's County. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. That's okay. We're asked a lot how we became fans because we're on the East Coast. So, right. You, you know, just before we get into all the you know Niners talk, how did you become a fan? My cousin, uh, my older cousin, was actually getting recruited. He played football in the area from um in Maryland, and he got recruited as a linebacker to play at USC and. At the time I was in elementary school, I vividly remember this. I was in the fifth grade, it was 1995. And he came back with all of this swag from his recruiting visit. And he didn't have anything for me. Um, and <laughs> at, five, at five years old, I was a big kid in the fifth grade. Uh, I was a really big kid. And uh, what he did as a contingency is he had got me a Niners satin red jacket. And I had no idea who the team was. And it was red, and he had let me know. No, man, we were in – I'll never forget this. We were in Sports Illustrated, and I picked up the jacket, and he told me, no, 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 go further down. No, it's 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 the maroon and gold. I said, no, no, this is this is good enough for me. And uh, at that time, we were uh, – at the time, Dion was, was as good as he could be, and the Niners were as famous as they could be, and – Mm -hmm. The Redskins were horrible. So it was also a perfect time <laughs> wow. for me to be the thorn in my family's side, who everybody was fans of this remarkably abysmal team. So um, that's how I kind of just got my stripes. And then you always pine as an East Coast fan because at the time, you know, cable really wasn't popping in. So like blackouts, you couldn't really watch the games that you wanted to. So you've always just kind of anytime you got a glimpse of seeing the Niners coming on our side or if they actually had a Monday night game, those are the times where we got a chance to actually get a, get our eyes on our boys. So that's kind of like the genesis of how I started and really just where I kind of came into the content side of things is uh, I was doing uh, physical security for quite some time while I was coaching football. And I hooked on to Grant and Grant and at, uh, Grant was pretty much one of the main guys that I was listening to at the time. And I was a chat baby in the chat, <laughs> talking, talking, you know, pushing all of my supers. And um, as push came to shove, you know how it is. All of us have support systems. And if you have a good support system, anytime you show interest in anything you do, they're going to push you. That's the type of support mm -hmm. system I have. You better not say anything that you want to do in passing because they're going to hold you to it. And, you know, as soon as, um, you know, coaching football was short lived for me. So I was always trying to find a way back to the game in some capacity. And um, as soon as I think my mother 
got wind of my shows with Grant as just being a guest, um, she saw it and that was it. She said, it is what you're doing. It's bad. I know you miss coaching. You can't do it. So you're going to do this. You're going to start your YouTube channel. So um, I've been kind of flying by the seat of my pants ever since then. And <laughs> here right. we are. It's working out. Yeah. <laughs> Making it happen. Definitely. Yep. Um, Carcast wants to know how far do you live away from Francis Scott Key Bridge? Far enough to be safe. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I stay about 45 minutes away from Baltimore. Okay. Cool. All right, Coach. Well, we lost the Super Bowl. You and I spoke about a long All time it. about it <laughs> a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, it was such a great conversation. Um, looking back at that game and then mm -hmm. looking ahead to now the draft, um, what do we have to do to get over that hump? Well, there's two sides of it, right? Because what you're looking at is a window that has been open for quite some time. And that's rare. A lot of teams don't get this much grace. They don't got this, they don't get this many whacks at the apple. And I'll tell you, the biggest thing for me is it's doing the best with what we have already. Because it would be disingenuous for me to kind of get granular and start talking about the draft and start talking about all of the four, all of the Monday morning quarterbacking that we can do. We can sit back and look at all of the vulnerabilities that happened during the game and say that we need a new right guard because of what happened on the last play of the game. Mm -hmm. Or we need a new free safety because Gip didn't see that deep pass going over in the first quarter. Yeah. Or, oh, man, when are we really going to get another receiver because, you know, it wasn't enough. And all of that stuff is kind of like it's lazy, quite honestly. Um, what we really need to do is we need to learn how to repurpose what we have and learn how to pivot. That's really what that last tenth of a second really is. We've all been there. We've all had endeavors and goals that we're trying to get at that we have failed at that, are, that have gotten the best of us. And you know, just like I know, it's never that one elixir that you were missing the entire time. It's something that you have to change within yourself. It's something that has to happen with process. It's something that you have to get at that you stay away from because it's your only way of doing things and it's gotten you this far. And if you move it, you're afraid that you'll completely get rid of the whole process. And that's truly what is going to get us over the hump because our process has been shown that there are flaws. We need checks and balances. We need an offensive coordinator, a real offensive coordinator, somebody that can grow under Kyle somebody that can challenge Kyle, somebody that can have more respect and evangelize the system amongst the team and or from a good faith basis. That's the thing about cross-referencing the things that you that things that you say are true. If I tell you something is true, yeah, you can believe what I said, but if you have a separate third party come and tell you that these things are true as well, it holds more weight. That's what having another offensive that's what having an offensive coordinator and on the team does for Kyle. Also, what I think that Kyle doesn't understand is that there are three types of people that you need in your life at all times, in my opinion, is you need peers to challenge you, to keep you going, to have like-minded motivation. You need a mentor, somebody to look up to, somebody that you should be learning from, that you should be seeing the way. And you need a mentee. Somebody who you should be, who should be humbling you and challenging you to always keep pushing forward so you can pass those things down. And that's something that I feel like Kyle is missing on our team. He needs a mentee. He needs somebody who's just as fiery as he was, fiery as he was in Houston, who can tell him that he wants to be aggressive and throw his arms up in the air in Cleveland like he did against Mike Patton when he was forced to run the ball when he wanted to pass. And these things are going to help him grow. These things are going to fit with time because we just talked about this backstage before the show started. Kyle is getting older. He's not the youngest guy anymore. He's not just some young gun that can come out and just give us his best laid plans and all of a sudden he's working. Kyle doesn't need clever anymore. Clever doesn't work, okay? He's been around long enough for people to understand who he is. Kyle needs to grow, 
All right. He needs maturation. And what I feel is though it's happening is that we're almost losing to the antithesis of Kyle's growth. We're losing to the very quarterback that Kyle refused to scout because he just knew that Kirk Cousins was going to be available in, in a year later. You know, it's like these things are hiding in plain sight if you look at them. And I'm here to tell you, like, it's it's almost kind of like the self-fulfilling prophecy because there is really no player. There's really no players that we're going to be able to ingest into what we've already had and just put us over the top with sheer might, will, and skill. That is what you should be able to be convinced of in the last Super Bowl that we just played. We were better than the Chiefs, pound for pound, including Patrick Mahomes with the whole mix. We were still a better team than them. So really what you have to look at is, is this team going to have a come to Jesus moment? Are they going to start pivoting and start using and utilizing the things that they need? Are they going to start doing things differently? Are they going to start using their running back by commit, going running back by committee? Are we going to start highlighting Brandon Ayuk mid-game when we understand that Debo isn't getting open? Are we going to stop putting Brock Purdy in bad positions where we're going five wide on third and four when it's really a two-down territory situation with the number one leading rusher in the NFL in the slot? instead of in the backfield, you know, these are things that are going to come to roost after a while if we keep doing them. You can't just keep leaning on one of the best defenses that the league has ever seen for five to six years. And now we're almost erring on the side of attrition, being top heavy, and being old enough to understand that there are teams like the Packers, there are teams like the, like the uh, Houston Texans, there are teams like the Lions who are coming. Okay, and they are loading their things up. Yes, and they understand that they had our goat, and we let them off the hook. They let us off the hook. So all I'm saying is, is that right now our answer. This is the 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 silver lining. Our answers are in the building. Okay, what we need to do is in the building, but we just I don't want the fans and as us and supporters to start kind of getting desperate and start out overreaching and going outside of our frame for things that are already here, right? I don't mind what they're doing with the offensive line by not shooting for the stars. We got to the Super Bowl with the offensive line we got now, okay? There's things that we can do to work, but the things that we have to do to get over the hump are like processing things. Quite frankly, I think they are a little too comfortable around each other. I'm glad there was no Cabo click pictures coming out this offseason. I'm happy for it. <laughs> there do there does need to be there does need to be a little bit more separation um in amongst the um organization. You know, they need to start looking at some of the things of you know it's not even airing on the side of a missed Super Bowl. If you really want to take it back and go 10,000 foot view, it's airing on the side of a missed dynasty when you look at how good these teams were throughout the years and what we truly got from them as far as results rendered so all of i i feel as though that these things can be changed they can be worked on but these guys need to start understanding that the last little part of being professional and being a championship is being intentful like not being prepared before the game, you know, just, you know, the alleged inebriated coaches during the press conferences, you know, not understanding the the overtime rules. And you know what's kind of crazy is that what's even wilder is not the fact that the coaches didn't know the overtime rules, but it's the fact that the players felt so comfortable just relaying that. Coaches didn't tell me this. I didn't understand this. You know, I needed to, I didn't, I didn't even know these rules. Things like that show that you're just not necessarily buttoned up on the small things. Jed, having a victory lap conversation with the media, admitting that the season was going to be was successful, whether or not we had lost to the Lions. Like, these things happen in real time. Like, if we can feel these things from 3,000 miles away on the East Coast and get secondhand embarrassment from these, from these interviews and say, probably not something you should have said there then you can feel that shit in the building. Trust me. So maybe, maybe don't drive to work with Peter King. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so I just, I I understand we're kind of erring on the side of being like corporate happy 
instead of being like organizationally happy. And that's mm -hmm. kind of where the rhetoric comes, where you kind of feel it. And then Jed all but confirms it with that type of rhetoric. Right. Or he comes back and doubles down into the off season um, in the owners meetings and um, gives comments uh, where he was asked, like, uh, you know, hey, if you do, uh, you said that championships, uh, you guys only hang out, hang championships banners. And if you don't win a Super Bowl, then you would see it as a failure. He asked him if he still feels that way today. And Jed said, no, he says, you can't be ashamed of a successful season. But our goal is to always win the Super Bowl. So which is it, Jed? Yeah. If the goal is to win the Super Bowl, but you can't be ashamed of a success, if you can't be ashamed of a, of a successful season, then which is it? Did you meet your goal or did you not? So you can't talk out of both sides of your mouth to fans that pay their bills for a living. I mean, this is kind of like garden variety, brass tack stuff that we make sure happens just to make sure the lights stay on. So, you know, you know how to listen to what somebody's telling you. And right now he's kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth and it's disheartening. Yeah, I um, I was saying to Maddie before everybody else came on that, you know, it would be nice if he just didn't talk at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, Coach, I had said to you a couple of weeks ago that he just he shouldn't be talking. Yeah. Yeah. Just take a break. <laughs> take a break. So, I mean, that's just to answer your question. I know I gave you the long form version. I, I gave you the scenic route, but just for me, um, that's how, that's how I see it. I don't, I don't feel as though that we're a team that was lucky getting to the Super Bowl. I think that was always our expectation throughout the entire year. And we achieved that. That was our expectation the last year. It's quite frankly, it's been our expectation for about five years. Right. And by hook or crook, they have met that expectation. Now, some of the endings have been gut-wrenching, but for better or for worse, they've been there. So for me, I don't want to get to the point where we get gaslit into saying, oh, well, we need this player and we need to get this guy. The defense is never good. No, no. We were good enough. It's us. Oh, yeah. We got to look inward. It's time to look inward. So Rick Diaz wants to know if uh, the 49ers are going to make a big run back to the Super Bowl. I wouldn't say you. I, I don't know what big run means, but I have every fiber in my body tells me we'll be there again. Mm -hmm. It's the same core, the same elements. We've just retooled some on the back end, right? Replace some starters on D-line. Actually looks better than last year. So Younger why and wouldn't we get there again? Mm. I see no reason why. Like, like Coach I, said, I gotta see. I like gotta Coach see what said, we do. Mm -hmm. This should have been a dynasty. And the only reason why we don't have multiple Lombardies over the past few years is because of us. Mm -hmm. We shot ourselves in the foot, done uncharacteristic things blah, 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 that have prevented it. But we've been the best team out there for years. So why would that change? It's a big 1988 vibe with this team for me. Like, I think last year was very, like, back in 87, like the number mm -hmm. one seed, they lost to, to Minnesota. The Vikings. But I think the... I think the Super Bowl loss to Kansas City was almost as bad as the loss to Minnesota in 87 because, like, they did all the things. And they had the miracle comeback against the Lions. And they survived the fact that they couldn't stop the running game against Green Bay. And they couldn't stop the running game against the Trent in the first. So you're like, all right, they got two weeks to get this all straightened out. And then, like, they lost the Super Bowl in one of the most agonizingly painful ways possible, right? With the same cast of characters and the same things coming back to bite us again the little things right the details mm -hmm. the commas the i dots the t crosses it's like are you kidding me this is really happening again we're going through this again right like and then it's all magnified because you are on the national stage so all these things that we have seen all year that like we got to clean this up we got to clean this up we got to clean this up they don't clean it up at the worst possible time it's like they're having a house tour and like they had a house party the day before, right? The still Cheetos all over the floor and we're just throwing this thing up on Zillow. Let's go, right? Like mm -hmm. 
at some point you just want to see them like i don't know i want to get this this sort of it just it seems to me like there's this 88 vibe i think they're going to struggle next year i i I, i'm concerned about the 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 division next year rams are better um arizona is going to be better because they'll actually have a quarterback for half the season um the the nfc west is not going to be as easy this year as it was last year um green Mm -hmm. bay as we mentioned we've already we've already gone over that detroit is absolutely pissed off and has some major 85 bear vibes around it which i don't think would be the case because you know come on but still i've seen it before and i wouldn't be shocked if it happened like that especially with the way they lost that game um and you know dallas has slipped off a little bit philly slipped off a little bit but atlanta's gonna actually have a quarterback next year right you know like an actual honest to god quarterback which if they had had one of those this past year they would have done a lot of stuff. And frankly, they beat us with no quarterback the year before. So, you know, like the NFC is going to be a little tougher this year. And the AFC isn't getting any easier. Joe Burrow is going to be back this year. Lamar Jackson is going to be pissed off. Um, Aaron Rodgers is actually going to play this year, right? Josh Allen is probably going to have to be utilized more for Buffalo because, you know, he's making more money now. So they had to cut a bunch of guys. So um, it's not going to be easy. I, I don't consider it a run. But I, I think they can go, you know, 11 and six and make it to the Super Bowl again. Maybe that's the best thing for them, right? Like, I thought they would have to get the bye week and do all the things that they needed to do to win the Super Bowl this last time. Well, they didn't do it. Maybe they got, maybe they just got to trudge through every week and, and not have any breaks and not be given any time to think about it, right? Maybe that's what they need. I don't know. I'm out of ideas, but I need to see the sixth Super Bowl soon because I'm, I, I cannot. I don't want to go back into the Dennis Erickson era again, right? I don't want to go back into that little slide, that slide piece. But I really like what you said, Coach. Like, mm-hmm. I thought this offense has kind of missed something since Mike McDaniel left, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think you have a guy in there that, you know, he works with, he trusts, he bounces things off of. I don't think the run game is nearly as ex- explosive as it was when he was here, for sure. Um, I don't think it's utilized as much. And I still don't understand why we're just leaning on McCaffrey all the time. I know he's really good. That, I know we that's really why it's not him. as explosive. You're, but it's like asking well, one guy to do lift all the the blocks, do all the work. Elijah, where's Elijah Mitchell? Where's George? Where, you know, like the dude can run. I mean, he did he did run for a thousand yards in an NFL season, right? Like that happened. I witnessed that. So, like mm-hmm. for him to just get a couple of, like pity carries or like, oh God. McCaffrey landed on his landed on his rib and can't breathe. Like, if that's the only carries you're giving him, like, what the what the hell is the point here? Like, what are we doing? Like, I don't know. There's certain things that need to be cleaned up, but at the end of the day, like, I don't. There's nobody else that would come in here that that, that like is going to be better. So it's like I'll, this is it. The answers are in the building. The answers in the building. I really well, want them to get a Belichick guy or a variable guy, some sort of like chippy guy to come in and maybe show him what's going on, but. That's not no, how it's going to be. No. no. And and in a way, uh, it's not going to work for an outside guy to come in because they're pretty entrenched. They know who they are. And also, like, the people that are inside of the building, they kind of know where the bodies are buried. They know who was the strongest guy, who's left, <laughs> who needs to get stronger, who's the coach that they kind of need to rally around. And the last thing they want is bringing in an outside guy who's going to start exposing some things that he doesn't like that are not up to snuff. That's kind of what happened to coach Wilkes. Um, I'm going to tell you this right now, man. Like he when said you come in, yeah, I mean, it's just the truth. I've already, listen, I have lived on like truth these 49ers. You know? Yeah. I've been living on these 49ers streets since day one. So I already got, I got the war wounds. I'll just say, I can say what I want to. And to be honest, it did. Um, he kind of got cultured out. And the reason is, is that, that's one of the reasons why when everybody here has a job and when there's a new manager that gets hired or when you have a takeover in the job, you know, the first thing that's happening, heads are going to roll. They are getting their people in there and they are getting the old people out of there. And it's not personal. It's just the way business is ran. I need my people in there to have my back to push my edict, to say that my stuff is the right things and you all better do it. And I need some snitches on my side. I need some people kind of giving me back. Who's the guy we need to make an example out of? Who's the guy who's who's the squeaky wheel? And you can't get any of that done 
as a coach Wilkes having an entire staff that's not your own, right? And on top of it, you have you're coming in here and you're the subject matter expert of the weakest unit on the team on the defense. So you're coming from zero, and then on top of it, you have other coaches where come on, I'm not here to speculate, but do you think Coach Kacarek was really putting his job on the line to defend Coach Wilkes if his players are telling him that they don't like the way the defense is being ran? No! He's going to tell them, yeah, I understand. Just wait it out. It is what it is. Kyle mm-hmm. hired this guy, and let's move on. And you can see how that moves along where word gets around. The best, like, I mean, the one thing that is hilarious is that you know, men talk about women talk. Like, men are the worst gossipers on planet Earth. We talk all the time. 100%. So, yes. So, do you mean to tell me as soon as Coach Wilkes got fired, he wasn't on the horn telling anybody under creation, like, yo, let me tell you about these bozos in Santa Clara. And let me tell you how this head coach got on air and threw me under the bus and how these players got up there and said that we weren't prepared, even though I got them to 19 points. We held Patrick Mahomes to 19 points regulation in the Super Bowl. 12, really? Okay. Oh, hello. All right. And the fact that we're going to talk about the the slip, the slip defense this year where they screwed up the groceries and had to get me three defensive linemen in the middle of the season hello. just so we could be whole, okay? And we're not going to talk about the fact that every time we did have defensive blunders where we lost to these teams, the offense only averaged 19 points during all of those times. Talk we're going to gonna talk about that. But what we can say is that when those things start happening, other teams are watching. Other coaches are watching. And you can't be a Mike Vrabel coming into this team ex- with your reputation, rather, right? These guys are not from Kyle's coaching tree. So they're coming in with their own cachet. They're not going to come in here and bend the knee and then let their let their reputation and their market value, their professional market value, take a hit if it doesn't work. Right. Everybody's not D'Amico Ryans and Robert Sala and and Mike McDaniels, where it just happens to work out for them. You know what I'm saying? So people are taking risks by being able to come here inside of like really an entrenched organization. Like we already have a set way of doing things. I mean, if you can come and in a way you can't even really be mad at mad at the Niners. It's like, look, bro, it's not we ain't hard up. We just lost the Super Bowl. We didn't lose round one of the playoffs. So we do have a little bit of power in our in our vetting process to say, hey, there's some hardcore pieces here that we're not willing to move on from because they just work for us. Right. Well, the caveat to that is, is that you're always going to you're going to come in with a man whose back isn't necessarily as straight as you want it to. Right. So we can ingest a Robert Sala. We can ingest a D'Amico Ryans who came up through and they've been here. So they were as strong. But anybody who you got coming in, they're already coming in with a few vertebrae out of their back because no real man is going to take on somebody else's staff. It ain't happening. You know what I'm saying? No, no real coach is going to say, oh, yeah, you know, I'll I'll take on Kasarik and Holland and all these. I'll take. No, nobody's going to do that. So that's why I keep. The cycle keeps turning. It's all about us. It's within. We kind of got on golden handcuffs. We're as good as we're going to be. We got everything we need. We're the only people that can come and save us because out, outside of outside of that, there's real no there's really no expert that's going to come in and just help the Niners unless Kyle is willing to uh, relinquish some power, which I don't see happening that- anytime soon. Or be open to objective criticism, and I think mm-hmm. that's something else that is – not something that this is i think they're open to criticism amongst themselves but from outside criticism they get this thing the way they want it and they don't they don't want that well That's a good kyle's point. like that friend who loves to tell it like it is until what it is is about him right so it's like you know like i can tell i i like you know what keeping i mean it like, real goes wrong yeah yeah it's like i love to tell you you know what it's like it's like Kyle, one of great Kyle's greatest attributes is that he just, you know, he just can't hold in the truth. It's just like, yeah, and he just conveniently runs away from it when it comes to him, too. You know what I mean? So it's just like, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. All I'm saying is, is that we've been here long enough. Like if if we've all been together for seven, eight years, you're going to notice 
my characteristics after a while. You're going to understand who I am. And I think that whether friend or foe or huge Kyle supporter or not, anybody can agree that Kyle's got some growing to do. He's got some growing to do. There's two people who can really give Kyle some constructive criticism. One is his dad, who we all know he listens to. The other person go is Jess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just that saying was the most, that was like a I'm Hollywood Square Brady thing. Hey, and right? I was, like, I'm here for it. Like, I'm waiting for Jim J. Bullock to like hit the <laughs> and, like, any second now. Jess, you gotta go in. We sending you in, man. You gotta go uh, in there. We got to get you a press pass. Start I mean, Ty was like, hour. Ty, yes. Ty was holding on to the tag rope at everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Like it was a legal tag. Go ahead, Becca. Becca's got something to say. Well, we I mean, I'm late to the party, and I'm sorry. I had some real technical difficulties. I don't know what that was about. Like, it's We got you right. now. That's good. Okay. Bro, I well, forgot yeah, my password last yeah. week, so you're good. It's fine. Yeah. You're all terrible. <laughs> like, it's just how it goes. I do not okay. recommend back to back conferences. It's not a good look. <laughs> you're delirious because you're working all day and then working all night because you're trying to catch up. I just <laughs> shut down teams, Becca. You're good. Look, you <laughs> made a comment about Kyle not accepting criticism and not wanting outside influence, but I feel like they gave Steve Wilkes a, a big old lifeline there to say, hey, we we give you some credibility with your ability, what you've done with defenses, even in like a crap ass Carolina team. You brought them some some game to the, you know, to the table. So we want you, you, you know our you kind of run our defensive style. But in that whole thing, you started to see, I felt like we started with D'Amico's system. We didn't change anything. And then we started in those those three big game losses, right? It's like when Steve Wilkes finally got to put his fingerprints on it. And then the guys start to say like little comments like, well, we really don't know what we're doing. Oh, well, that's, you know, we're confused. We're not sure. It's, it, they, they start to like leak out the secret, like, he's doing things we're not sure about. We don't understand. It's not our core thing that we've been doing and you know we've hit on this a bunch of times like I feel like that's exactly what happened you heard that coming out of the team no one wants to throw anyone under the bus this team is not like that and Feliciana was the only one to do it after the Super Bowl but these guys have each other's back but you hear them say little hints about what's not working and I think when Steve Wilkes tried to put his imprint on the defense that wasn't working. So I don't know that that's necessarily Kyle's fault because when he finally turned the reins over to Steve Wilkes, it starts to unravel and you it culminates in a Super Bowl where like they don't even know the freaking overtime rules and they don't know what to do. They're not sure how to play. And I, I don't know, like if your job is defensive coordinator, that is your job. Own it. And then when you lose from the defensive side of the ball, well, that's your pro that's your problem. You better own that, and you have to have you have to own that. To to say that Kyle is running every single freaking little thing, that's uh, that I don't think that that's entirely true. Yes, he has his handprints on everything, but but if you're the guy calling the plays on the defense, that's your job. So when something fails there, you're of course you're going to be the guy that's that's out. But I don't disagree about like yes, he takes all his cues from his daddy. You know he's getting quality sage advice from his father with his own imprint on it. And we have promoted well with from within and it's worked beautifully. And I think that's why we went back to that footprint because the guys, the team, the players are going, no, 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 it's got to be this guy. We don't want another stranger coming in here trying to change what's working for us. This guy from the outside had some crazy ideas. Like he was in the booth. We didn't like that, you know, so they moved him to the down to the field. Lots of little things can really little changes can make a big impact with your players, with your team, with your whole culture. And so I feel like they they went outside their comfort zone bringing Steve Wilkes in and then now you see the retraction of the rubber band coming back like nope, we're going to hone it in, keep it home and we will figure out a way to win with our people who know us best. 
Brian Cope wants to know whose fault is it when players don't listen to the coaches? Who should leave? Well, I think you saw the answer. <laughs> you, you did. You, it's the guy you, they you point the finger at. The, uh, and, and but there's a couple of different things here. Now, one, there's definitely the guys that they brought in for that defensive line definitely have a different vibe, attitude, setup as opposed to last year's guys. I think in terms of like running ability and didn't say brick walls and things of that nature. Um, you know, the Malik Collins, the Jordan Elliott's, things of that nature. You know what I mean? Like there's definitely a sort of vibe there. And then however you feel about Steve Wilkes, like they're going to, they're going to do both in that case. So, um, but the thing about him definitely makes sense. It, it makes sense. Now the outsider thing probably saw some things you didn't like. And then they kind of like, Oh, you need to be down, down on the field instead of being up to the thing. Like, I don't care where my defensive coordinator right. is. Like I should trust him. You know what I mean? And clearly there was no trust there for whatever reason. I don't know why, but here's another thing that Shanahan said this week that I, that I read It's actually in one of the, I believe one of the Mayoko articles, he talked about how he thought Nick Sorensen was ready last year, but he's beyond ready this year. Why don't you just hire Nick Sorensen last year and then have Steve Wilkes do what you're doing with Brandon Staley this year? Maybe because he's it's a learned shot in from the that. arm for Nick Sorensen. It's and a that's shot what that is. Boosting him up. Yeah, it's a shot in the arm to make him feel as though that he was real. He this isn't just your first year. He's kind of given him a fictitious early on year. Like really, if you look at what the defense did this year, it's kind of really what Nick Sorensen was doing behind the scenes. It's an ode to that. But really, it's exactly what you're saying. If you think that Nick Sorensen is your guy, then why do you wait and whiff on all of the guys that you could have got last year? And then we're forgetting Coach Wilkes was not a number one. He wasn't our first decision right. at defensive coordinator. All right. Vic Fangio is the one who yeah. jilted us. That's who we wanted to get. So you mean to tell me that Nick Sorensen was more than ready last year, but Vic Fangio said no. And then you said, hey, Nick, you calm down. Let's go get the other guy from Carolina who none of our coaches or our staff knows that he's going to be the outside guy. I mean, quite frankly, I don't know if this is a child show or not, but it's bullshit. It just doesn't fly. <laughs> Basically, it's, it's, it them like, a, like, like, like they treat their rookies, right? Hey, yeah. we're going to redshirt you a year yeah. and then put yeah. you in place next year. You just hold tight. It's very much that. You don't have the resume – that we want to to throw out there as the face of our defense with the number one defense in the league. We don't want to just go, oh, hi, uh, here, Dick Sorensen. Um, here, look, look at his guy. Look at this guy's uh, ID badge. You know, here, here's our new guy. You can bring in a Steve Wilkes who has some cachet and a, and a name and a brand. And people are going to be like, yeah, we just got, we got a good guy to be, run our defense rather than, Oh, here we're gonna turn up next guy up who that, that no one knows name. And I think people people really took to having Steve Wilkes more than they would have taken to a Sorensen that is a not a known name in the household or a commodity that anybody's gonna be like, whoo, excited about. They do I think they do take that into consideration. All these teams do. They worry about with the fans and, and the image and, and impressions going to be uh, on some level and how that's going to gel with management. I, I don't know. I just feel like last year they didn't think he was ready for it. And they, they were excited to get this veteran guy to come in and maybe do something with our defensive linebackers, you know, the, the, the guru that he's supposed to be. I mean, I just, I just think that that shows more of, how Kyle does business rather than the actual performance of the coaches he hires, right? Because it's like if if Kyle wanted to bring in a guy that, I mean, basically held more weight is what I believe you're trying to say, Rebecca. It's like, you know, bring a guy that the fans can actually get behind. There's more meat on the bone. He has an actual cachet and a reputation behind him. Right. And look how we felt about Coach Wilkes midseason and throughout the season. I mean, a guy that had already came up to bring the reputation by week eight, Kyle was already saying, Wilkes know what he knew. Wilkes know how he messed up. Hey, by the way, we don't like how the defense is being ran. You need to switch your modus operandi and come down on the field because that's what the players want. And then by the end of the season, we felt all but okay with him being fired. 
Now, if we could do that to a 20 plus year veteran who's come in with multiple with multiple head coaching appearances and coming off of and coming in as a subject matter expert with the with the secondary, what do you think Nick Sorensen would have been by this year? Do you think we would have had the same we would we would have had the same patience for Nick Sorensen had he been our DC this year? We'd be wanting him fired just as much. Hundred percent. I was not following. Huh? And, and there's something to that. Look at Jimmy Tom Sula. He got pushed into the interim head coach, and the only the only outcome of that was he was getting fired. He was not prepared to be a head coach. He was none of that. He was a defensive back guy that was great at his job for 20 plus years. You put someone in a job that they're not prepared for, you set them up for failure, and the only outcome is dismissal because, you know, it's it's not going to go well. So uh, maybe Kyle was protecting Nick Sorensen from having that outcome and trying to school him up a little bit more this year to be prepared for this role. I and, tend to believe that. Okay. She- you, you know, you got to raise the raise the platform and get some guy in a right – Put the person in the right position for for leadership and success rather than failure. You bring in a guy like Steve Wilkes, who has this resume of supposed expertise. But I tell you, I say it every time, the first half of that season, we ran the same defense we ran last year. We dominated everything. It wasn't until we lost those three games in a row that all of a sudden we needed him down on the field. We needed him on the field the after they those three. The scapegoat. He became the scapegoat. We switched from what we were but, doing to his his defense, but did, but, and but, that but is when it went off the cliff. I just think I think that you needed a scapegoat because had we lost those three games with Nick Sorensen at the defensive coordinator with the all, oh. nobody would have cared. Exactly. About, hold on. Nobody would have cared about the defensive performance because everybody would have said, Kyle, how in God's green earth are you going to lay these losses at the feet of a rookie defensive coordinator yeah. when you yourself have only put up 19 points in a month? You're, 17. You, you're, you are 17, 17 points. So th- let's, let's even exacerbate the situation. If let's just say we get to the end of the Super Bowl, everything happens carbon copy the same way it happened, right? And then Kyle's caveat for being unprepared during the game, not knowing the overtime rules, and essentially only scoring 19 regulation point 19 points of regulation with how that game ended. Kyle's answer to everything is I'm firing Nick Sorensen. There'd be outrage. No, nobody would take that as nobody would take that as as adequate sacrifice. Nobody would. Everybody say, so? What are you firing Nick for? You're the one who can't get the points up. I agree with you. I think a lot more of that would lay in his feet. But he hired a quality veteran defensive coordinator to fill that role. And that guy didn't live up to expectation. He didn't perform well. His defense didn't perform well. They're out there. They're saying it verbally that they didn't know what the hell they're supposed to do. So now you can absolutely lay that at his feet. If you hire a rookie and you bring this rookie guy up, like you absolutely have to, to own some of that. If your rookie defensive coordinator loses the Super Bowl because your guys don't know what they're doing. But if you hire a guy who's been in the league for 100 million years, who's supposed to be a great defensive coordinator, those guys better be ready on the field. They should be a number one, Johnny on the job. You're in the Super Bowl for crying out loud. There's no excuse. And I, I do not disagree with the Steve Wilkes firing for that reason. Like, come on, man. Like, that's a total come on, man situation. You cannot expect Kyle to own all of that. You hire a guy who's got all this, these years of experience who's supposed to do this. That's his job. He gets paid a lot more than we do. To, to go out there and coach up a team to be ready to play in the Super Bowl. You're a defensive guru. Do your job, man. If you don't, well, then you get what's coming to you. And I feel like it it I feel like it was a little bit of scapegoating, but also the, the guys were parroting, you know, listen to the words they say in these little sidebar, you know, things and they do these little interviews. Well, we didn't know the rules for overtime. How? 
What's your defensive coordinator doing? Hold on, 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 not knowing the overtime rules was not a Coach Wilkes blunder. That was a Kyle Shanahan. He's blunder. the head coach. Exactly. He's the head coach of the team. All right. And when we're the going. The players it, did say that all the position coaches knew it was their jobs to relay to the players. Well, there you go. Hold on. The players said what, Jen? Mm -hmm. Just the players, sorry. The player, that's okay. The players did say that the position co it was the, the the position coaches. I'm sorry, Kyle did say that the position coaches were supposed to relay those overtime rules to the players. Right. See, so, but that's a question. Why is that happening? It, I thank you. I, I don't. I that that's something I don't like because like that to me is like saying, hey, I told them to do it and they didn't do it. Like at the end of the day, like I'm wanting Kyle in that situation to be like, that's on that's me. That's a PSA. Uh, that's an APB. However, that's an all points bulletin situation. However, that's not, hey, pass yeah. this along. Yeah. I don't know. And, 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 for context, done, for me, context, and I right? love this conversation. For context, for context, <laughs> the Chiefs said that they went over this in training camp because they knew that they would be in this situation. They said that they went I've over this in training I've been camp. There before. So, yeah. And didn't we just have a situation? Didn't we just have a conversation saying this was our plan all along was to make it to the Super Bowl? Yeah, but yep. but, but listen, it's the it's, it's Kyle's the head coach. It's the position coaches to relate his information, but everyone always focuses on Steve Wilkes' players didn't know what's happening. You notice right. how all the focus is going to him. And full stop. Now, full stop. He deserves to be fired because his players lost faith in him. That's enough. OK, so when you lose when you lose your voice in a locker room, you are officially ineffective as a coach. So that alone is enough. The fact that they threw him under the bus, if there was a problem, lets me know that you are not connecting with your teammates. I mean, with their players the way you need to. So I'm not I'm not mad or I don't take umbrage with him losing his job. He deserved to lose his job because part of being a coach is galvanizing the players around you. So if they don't believe your message up front, you're dead in the water off rip. So I'll give, I understand that if they're not hearing this message, there's no reason why he should be here. But to say that, to say that there were clerical errors as to why he was being fired as he's, as he's holding Patrick Mahomes to 19 points. I think that's rich. Yeah. I think that's rich. That's a little rich. Well, but, but I mean, hold up. The, the whole overtime thing is a cop out. First of all, that's a whole cop out on a whole nother level, because whether you don't know the rules or not, you still got to go out and play football. Defensively, you have to stop the other team. Offensively, your job is to still go score. Doesn't matter what the rules are. You still have the basic functions that you're supposed to perform out there. So that whole, oh, I didn't know the rules. So that meant you couldn't tackle someone. That meant you're not supposed to block the best defensive player on the team. That's that's a whole cop out that should never be talked about ever again, because you still got to play football no matter what. Well, and I agree with you, Ty. I was just going to say that comes to a personal accountability, because if you play football for a living, what do you need to know if you're playing in the Super Bowl? Every rule that can possibly apply to the biggest moment of your life. If that's your job, you better know what's supposed to happen or possibly could happen on the field. So, I, I mean, I do lay a lot of it at Steve Wilkes, but also every player who's coming up going, oh, I didn't know what my job was supposed to be. <laughs> no, this is your job. This is your day job every day. If I walked to my, up to my CEO and said, well, I didn't know that we needed a license to ship something to Iran. Rebecca, we'd fired. like to put you on the pip. To prison, you know? we'd, like, we'd like to put you on the pip. Uh, we got to have a conversation, Rebecca. No, no, I'm going to prison in my job. I'm going okay. straight <laughs> to the federal. You heard Mike right now. Yeah. It, we uh, need do her not for sure. Go, do not collect $200. This bitch going straight to prison. <laughs> you mean we can't just open free trade with Cuba here? Like, I didn't know this. Like, Two wow. picks. Like, 
pencils. You can't even ship that to Cuba. You cannot. It is illegal. So I'm just saying, like, there are things that personally you, you absolutely need to know. So to your point, yeah, I agree. Like, you can't lay it all at Steve Wilkes' feet. But the players were very much chirping about, like, not understanding what was the changes he was making. They said oh. things. They did. After Cleveland, after we had the three losses in a row, I think that's when he got, like, the reins to take over. And you started to hear little quippy things that they were saying. And I was like, mm, I don't think Steve Wilkes is working out. Then he went down on the field. We won, but we were not dominating. The first half of the season, same defense. We freaking blew the walls off of, off of everybody we played, right? We walked back into the season with the same defense, held everybody to 17 points or less. We outscored them by a lot. Every single one of those games. Then we start, we lost those three games. And the back end of the season was not as dominant. The defense slipped a lot. And I think that's where Steve was in, you know, instilling his own defensive, his own defensive stuff. Hold on. And that's where it started to go downhill. Hold on. We gave Rebecca, up what are you three about? points to the Rams in week two. Yeah. Versus Cleveland, the game we lost, we gave up 19 points. The next week versus the Vikings, we gave up 22 points. But that's what I'm saying. The first half of the season, when we were perfect. What was the difference between the Rams game and the Browns and the Vikings game when we gave up um, more points to the Rams? I'm saying we were the number one defense in the first half of that season. That was weak, but the the Rams flamed us. You don't remember that game? I do. That was not good defense. Uh Uh-uh. We had a lot of injuries, though, too, in that game, as I recall. We had several people uh, out with injury in that game. But uh, the first I understand. Moment- I understand what you're saying, though, Rebecca. Yeah. I, I understand that Steve Wilkes is an imperfect vessel. I'll give you that. Yeah. I just I feel as though that when uh, when Jess first asked me, "What are we going to do to get over the hump?" I talked about a lot of things, a lot of process that we needed to change in-house, right? And one of the last things that I even mentioned was Steve Wilkes needing to go. I don't think, I feel as though that he needed, Steve Wilkes is not up to snuff as far as the defensive coordinators that we have, we're accustomed to. Yeah, That much is true, right? But Steve Wilkes is far and away bottom on the list as to the reasons why we did not win the Super Bowl this year. And I feel like him being fired at the end of the year, the way he got fired in a way was a dog whistle as to, all right, that's that we, we kind of got rid of that blunder that kind of, we can throw all all of our problems out with Steve Wilkes, the, the overtimes, the, the not being prepared, the players lacking effort, jogging on the field, us uh, giving up all of those rushing yards and not being prepared against the Packers or the Lions, all of that gets put into one nice box and gets thrown and cast into the sea of forgetfulness mm-hmm. with Coach Wilkes. And that is a little icky. It, that is it, it, icky. It, that, that's that's, very that's icky. You know what I'm saying? That's what makes you that. feel like, all right, so there's going to be no accountability. And then once Wilkes is gone, and there's still residual questioning, there's still yeah. residual questions hanging out there like, all right, guys, Super Bowl's over. Kind of give us your process of the overtime thought process. Like, talk to us. And then the stories don't match. And it's, oh, well, when we first got asked on the field, was it because of defense? No, it wasn't because of defense. That wasn't my thought process. All right. Well, then we get inside of the press conference, and then John kind of throws up a softball to Kyle. Like, pay attention, Kyle. And he's going, yeah, well, you know, I kind of thought it was because of defense is the reason why – we kind of wanted the ball first to give our defense a rest, right? And then Kyle goes, like, oh, yeah, it's definitely because of defense. And it's just things like that where it's like ugly falls on ice. It's like, dude, just fall. Why are you trying to stay up? You are causing so much attention to yourself. That's what happens with these instances where all we're looking for is a little bit of loving. We ain't going nowhere. We're going to be fans tomorrow. But can you just take the moment to at least act like you care? Where it's like, all right, guys, here goes the hat in hand moment. 
The millionaire is going to act like a normal guy for 45 seconds. Get ready. Guys, we made a blunder. We didn't pay attention to these things. There was a preparedness gap with understanding process. And quite frankly, we were a little on our toes. You guys are going to be able to see it when the, when the video comes out. You're going to see me looking a little crazy. Be self-deprecating. Make a joke about yourself. Be human. Something. But don't sit on your ivory tower when you're being asked basic questions, especially, and this is the thing that's crazy, is that when they lose, sometimes Kyle doesn't give off the fact that it's our loss. You're not the only one that's upset. You're not the only one who really wanted to win. And sometimes he takes his ball and he goes home, especially with, with him lacking accountability in those moments. That's really my only issue. Well, I think he just internalizes it so deeply because it's so personal. I, I get that. I get that as a type A personality. Like when something doesn't go the way you want it to, all you want to do is go crawl in a hole and just have to like process that by yourself. To have to go stand in front of people and talk about it, it's very difficult. It's really, really a hard, <laughs> like not an okay moment in your life when you have to say, I screwed up or, or this didn't go how I planned it. And I put so much of my blood, sweat and tears into it. And you don't understand how much of my life I've given to this and to, to have to stand here and take criticism over it. I get it. I get his perspective a hundred percent. Like I do not criticize him for any way he behaves in press conferences because I understand like this is every mo every waking moment of his life is spent doing just this and to have to to face criticism from people who don't even understand the process and people who have a, you know i will put myself in that same category elementary levels of understanding of anything that i'm doing in my my job that you know it it's hard to have to sit there and hear you know, noise from people who just aren't on your level, who you who will never be, and you have to sit there and and face all of that criticism. I, I don't but know. That's what bleeds <laughs> through, Rebecca. Yes. That's what bleeds through in those yeah. moments, and, and yeah. that's the problem. It's kind of like let me let me put it like this. Like let's just say let's do like a little exercise right now. Let's say if for some reason John Harbaugh, right? just came out and said, and we talked about this, Jess, when John Harbaugh came out and he says, you know, guys, you know what? Um, the city of Baltimore has pricked my heart. And I understand that football seems to be the thing that we need to do right now, but I want to start a church. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go into church. I'm going to be a youth pastor. Everybody will be shocked. Right. But nobody would bat an eye as far as the character of the man of who we know John Harbaugh to be. Right. If Mike Tomlin came out one day and said, you know what, guys, you know, coaching is awesome, but I, I really want to run for office. I want to run for the mayor of Pittsburgh. Right. And this is something that I want to do. Nobody would bat an eye. Pete Carroll, if Pete Carroll wanted to be a motivational speaker, nobody would bat an eye. If Mike Vrabel wanted to be the town sheriff or whatever top or town he wanted to do to clean up the city of Memphis, nobody would think that Mike Vrabel wasn't a badass who could put on a gun belt and handle his business, right? <laughs> Andy Reid looks like your plumber. He looks like a pediatrician. He could be your butcher, right? A baker. And the, the, yeah. a baker. <laughs> these are, these are. He's smoking is, meat, guys. Come on. You know it. All right. I know it. Exactly. You know he has got a meat smoker somewhere. And he's like, listen, you got to try these ribs, guys. You exactly. Try these that would ribs. be his second <laughs> career. Marv Levy and Bill Rose Belichick. Rose Rose. Come on. Brian Belichick will probably be one of the illest math teachers on, on the face of this earth. He would he would kill his students. What would Kyle be without football? Who is the man? Who is he? What can you show us outside of knowing your X's and O's? What can you do that shows us how you galvanize a group of men outside of your expertise? Where's the feel? Where's the beef? That's And that's what Kyle is losing to. He's losing to men. He's losing to people who have a hold on their team where X's and O's are superseded. 
right? You can see a situation where Travis Kelsey goes up and runs into a a Andy Reid because he's frustrated on getting over on the field. And Andy Reid looks at Travis Kelsey, looks like him, like he's a petulant child asking for McDonald's on the way home. Will you calm down? I will get you on the field when you need to be on the field. What would Kyle have done if George Kittle runs into him like that on the sideline? What I'm saying is is that Kyle, he has shown us all of the disdain for failure that he can. Maybe he needs to throw us a curveball and show us a little bit more. The way Travis Kelsey talks to Andy Reid is disrespectful and it's rude and it's a pattern of abuse and I don't like it. And I think it's horrifying to see on TV, especially with now all of the the little girls watching this man being the queen's boyfriend and the way he treats another human being is horrifying. George Kittle would never go up to Kyle Shanahan because he knows he doesn't have to. He knows he never has to go to Kyle and be like, why am I not getting the ball? George Kittle understands his role and understands exactly what he's supposed to do in his job. That is a terrible, terrible thing to say and a terrible reference. And I will not allow that. Sorry, I disagree. 100%. I'm going to tell you right Mm -hmm. now that men run the team and coaches coach the team. And when it's time to win games, Mm -hmm. You can't be stuck to your plays and what the man on the sideline is willing to do. You got to be ready to take over the game. And what you saw was men, who a man who felt like he could take over the game at that point. And he was frustrated. And he wanted to get on the field. That's what what I saw. You saw frustration and you saw how he handled frustration. Mm -hmm. He went and attacked someone. How's that man going to be when he's frustrated at home? He's going to go attack the person in front of him. It's a pattern. Oh, I don't. Well, look, I don't. I, I don't attack. I don't. I don't attack the man yeah. while he's at work. If somebody's no, I, if somebody's making a hamburger, I'm not going to ask what they do with the hamburger fired. at home. If you're doing that at work. You're going to get fired. In a, in any other job, you're getting fired. So I don't. Oh, think he's in a perfect job description. Perfectly, I agree with no, you there. I'm just saying, George Kittle's not doing that on the field. None no. of those guys are running up to Kyle Shanahan doing that. He's a. In fairness, child. George Kittle couldn't run up to him because he had a torn core muscle so yeah, you know exactly you no know, like we we're lucky he was even playing in that he game wasn't gonna do it anyway maddie get it out. i can, re- I can respect <laughs> you disagreeing though um, I can respect you disagreeing. no i respect you i respect Sorry, but it is, is horrifying and awful and it's not okay and i'm not gonna sit here and, and allow people to make excuses for his behavior for it no no i'm, I'm not, not making excuses i respect your opinion men do that to women and it's awful and it's not okay and yeah it's not okay on your job it's not okay in your life and that's my message to any little girl who's watching. If someone behaves like that in front of you, it's not okay. It's not okay. Literally, it's not a way to live. It's not a way to work. I don't. I don't care what it is. If anybody mm-hmm. does that to you, I don't care what you've got going right. on. It's a bad time. It's a bad time. Hundred percent. All right. So while we're on the topic of Kyle Shanahan, um, one nice thing that we don't have to talk about is the quarterback situation. Thank you. Ooh. I don't know. And I heard some rumble. Or the backup quarterback rumbling. situation. Or do any of it. <laughs> yes. So let's take a listen to see what Kyle had to say about his QB number one. It stands alone. Plays in a Super Bowl in just his second season. Shouldn't he be more celebrated? I mean, as just kind of the standard quarterback when you see all these other guys drafted ahead of him? All of a sudden, now kind of lost in the in the shuffle. I mean, it shows how hard it is to play quarterback in this league. I mean, there's 32 teams, and um, there's definitely not 32 guys. And even when you do have those moments, the pressure, like for a guy to do it over and over, week in and week out, and it's such a team game. It's dependent on so many different um, aspects. But the pressure is always on that guy, and each week, and even when Brock, who's been unbelievable in these two years, getting us to the NFC Championship, getting us to the Super Bowl, and when you do that, just the standard changes. So right when people see you're in that club, then they're going to try to see where in that club you are, and it uh, really never stops. Um, you know, there's the pressure that is on those guys. That's why it's one of the most high-paid positions in the league, or definitely the most high-paid <laughs> position, because uh, they got to earn it, and they do earn it. But Brock's done that these last two years. He's been unbelievable. Uh, he's done a week in, a week out. He's come back from an 
really tough injury in his first year, had a hell of a year this year, really hasn't had an offseason yet with us. Um, the first offseason, he was you know, battling to be our third string quarterback and make the team. Uh, last year in the offseason, he didn't get a throw until training camp. So I'm just pumped that, you know, he got married here a couple weeks ago. Right. So he's going to come back a, a full man and be and healthy and um, <laughs> ready to attack this offseason. And I'm pumped to coach him. And just, just with him having a full offseason with you, how do you think that's going to help him graduate? Um, I mean, I think it's just so – everything's about repetition. I mean, it's not – it's, you, you can learn it right away. It's about going through it. And Brock's gone through a lot in two years in, in these games, so that's been great for him. Um, but the way you get better is doing it over and over in practice and just drilling it. And it's all about getting those 10,000 reps. And he spent it all last year knowing what he had to do, but he was just focusing, focusing to get his arm healthy. Now he can go into this offseason knowing what he has to do, but training his footwork, training his arm, um, training his mind, just getting in the reps, hopefully in OTAs. You never know how those go, but um, hopefully we can have a good OTAs, get him that experience. He'll start throwing with the guys here in phase one and two. And um, you get away for 40 days and you come in and training camp's right around the corner. All right, so with Kyle saying what he said about Brock Purdy, Coach, I'm going to start with you. Um, what are your thoughts going um, forward with Brock Purdy? Uh, I think uh, it, we're still in a wait and see. Um, we got to see how far Brock grows this year. This is a really big year for Brock because I feel like this is the first year he's going to be able to have a full season unmolested. He's not, he's not going to be hurt. Um, he's got the, he's got two years of the offense under his belt, along with two years of the same guys in the offense. Not only that, uh, he's going to be able to grow with the team. They're going to be able to bring in new players. Also, uh, I think that Brock is going to be able to get his arm back. Uh, Brock actually put 12 miles per hour on his throwing velocity from coming out of college into camp, um, through, uh, a lot of the work that he did with um, his quarterback coaches. And I feel like a bit of that may have been stifled throughout the UCL injury and the rehab thereof. And possibly coming into this off season, I feel like he could get a stronger arm. There could be things that we could see from Brock that we haven't seen um, before. Um, he's gonna be more comfortable. Uh, like we said, he's married, so he's a little bit more mature. We haven't had a married quarterback in for the 49ers in a while. I think he's going to be able to lead the te team differently. I know that sounds like a little joke, but that's that plays. That actually matters. It really yeah, does. Yeah. Um, so do I think that uh, – I want to be able to see Brock once the court gets shaken up, right, because we're talking franchise. Now, we're just saying if he's good, do we have a quarterback? Of course we have a quarterback. He's, he's the best that we've had since Jimmy, right? Better than Jimmy. However, uh, you know, franchise quarterbacks stand the test of time of regimes, right? Uh, Patrick Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes stood the test, the test of time of seeing a lot of guys come and go, and he's still been that guy. That's what I just want to see out of Brock. I just like to see the consistency of what we've already seen. All things considered, Brock has been above average. He's been more than advertised. Um, anybody who says that he's as advertised would have to say that they saw what he was when he was coming in and they'd be lying. Um, so they you would, all, you would have to look <laughs> at Brock as exceeding expectation. And this is something else when I speak to the consistency of Brock that I've always brought up that won me over on Brock. I wasn't, I'm proud to say that I wasn't in on Brock right away. Um, I'm, I'm never in on every anything right away. I was screwed. I, I looked at him, I criticized his game uh, viciously. And what won me over with Brock was, number one, I remember the game. It was the Cincinnati game that won me over when the team was like complaining like complete shit and he was playing his ass off. He was keeping us in that game single-handedly, in my opinion. Um, off script. Off. Yep. You, that, what, that if, what, have we, what have we begged for for years? Uh, please, That's, please, please. We need off script. We need to, he we, he beat needs to be able me to go into, off script. He beat me into fandom that game. He did. The Cincinnati game this year? Yes, it, the game we lost. Go and watch Brock in that game we lost. Brock was fighting. Oh, I remember it. There were so many opportunities where our he team some was blows and us took some down, blows man. too. But the offensive line was doing him no favors. He was getting outside of the pocket, still delivering. And I kept saying during the whole game, I was saying, Kyle is going to screw this kid. He doesn't have enough left because you can only have so many tricks up your sleeve when you're that young. 
you just don't see it all right away. So you're just reacting off of instinct. And after a while, you have a little bit of muscle memory and instinct takes over and people and people take over. That's And that's what I saw in that game. I really feel like the, the game, that Cincinnati game is when I, the first time we lost and I said to myself, the team let Brock down. And that's when I was in the Trent Ooh, his 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 ints didn't let him let us down also though nah because you know why and the reason why i say that the reason why i say that ty is because he was doing so much to keep us in the game thus far that by the time he had thrown the picks he he had already he had already helped our team out so much it really was up to our team to get him across the finish line we weren't even supposed to be in that game if it wasn't for brock playing the way he did in that game honestly cincinnati came out and had 19 completions in a row joe burrow was going off against wow. us we were a sieve and on top of it uh who is running uh mixing he had eight yeah, Joe Mixon ran all over us. They had a really good day on us as well. Like, I'm telling yeah. you. The hell does that have they, to do with the offense? Well, it has to do with the team. They <laughs> hopped on us right well, away. To do with, you're, we're talking about the offense, though. No, but he's, the saying, quarterback. Like, he's just saying that everything Cincinnati the, the, did Nothing us. was working. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The only oh, bright okay. spot. The, that's what I'm saying. Ty, the stuff. only bright spot for us yeah. through three quarters of that game was Brock Purdy. Okay. That's it was why a dark was and stormy day, and the only shining light we had was. <laughs> that's why I was. Yeah, I'll be yeah, real with you. The story's going. That's, yeah, that's when I was sold. And and once I started looking at him as a guy that could go out there and hunt for his own food, once I saw that he could go out there and actually be good on his own, then I started understanding that one thing about football is, and I was I'm a, I'm a tray guy. I was a tray guy, and. One thing that you had to eat as being a Trey guy is that Brock came in and he got his opportunity and he never looked back. And I know what it feels like to be thrusted in positions in my life where all I needed was a shot. Just give me one shot. And I've had people to this day that are still saying that my shot is a fluke years later. And they still are in disbelief about the fact of that I had the consistency. So I'm telling you, I know I went a little Disney plus, I know, but <laughs> all I'm saying is, is that Brock's consistency has won me over because it's hard to be consistent in this league. Okay. It really is. No matter how good your team is, something's the bottom's going to fall out. Something's going to show. And I just refuse to believe that the league is so bad that this kid has been able to just be hidden for two whole years. It just doesn't work that way, right? So at some point, you got to notice there's something about the kid that's genuine. There's something that, that's legit, right? So for me, that's why I believe in the kid. Do I think he's a franchise guy? That, yes, that has yet to be seen because we have a very unusual team in that we have so many talented players on both sides of the ball. So it's almost impossible to get a real look at him, right? But I will say this, as far as a guy that can lead this team for what we have now, he more than fits the bill. He does. Yeah, I mean, so I'll say this, like but when he took over, I listened to the word, and I'm always telling people, listen to what people say, that players were so excited. Like you could hear them saying measured things, like they didn't want to diss Jimmy, they didn't want to diss Trey. But they were like, oh, you're going to be surprised. Oh, don't worry about Brock being QB1. It's going to be okay. Like, you have Kittle and you have these guys stepping up saying words like that. I'm like, they believe in this guy. They have some confidence here. And from day one, I was like, if the players are saying things that they're not up here going, oh, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to go. This is, oh, what up? This is, this is a mess or going on social media, blowing things up. The, the players were saying words that I was like, listen to what these guys are saying because they're the ones who are running scout team with him. They know what he's doing. They would sit there and say, you know, if you have the chance, you better throw, throw it. Just take the shot and try. And we're successful when you're doing that. And they would say like these key 
interesting things about Brock Purdy that they would not say about Trey Lance and they would not say about Jimmy Garoppolo. And I was like, I think we're going to be all right because the players want him to be QB1. You hear it, the the – the like I don't know measured excitement in their their comments that that they were saying I've been I've been on the Brock Brock Purdy you know like look the team knows more than we do I love Trey you know we gave him a shot he got injured unfortunately he got you know it, it is what it is but that's the next man up mentality so if that's where we go you get your shot it doesn't work this guy gets his shot and and he's capitalizing. He has some talent. There's there's definitely something to it. You're absolutely right. You don't win in this league unless you can play the game. The, it, the, the, the measurables are so close across the board that you better have talent. You're not it's gonna get exposed if you don't. So but the, the players is what cued me into their words, their their assessment was I was like, all right, this guy's got something, they're all excited about it. So he's gonna be the dude. And then he got hurt, you know, in the championship game and and came back. Like, like, were we all not talking about, like, what's going to happen? Is he going to see ghosts? Are we going to have problems like Jimmy did? You know, like, ooh, ooh, who's coming to get me? You know, you see these guys get hurt and then they're worried. We stopped talking about Brock Purdy coming off of surgery by, you know, week three, four. We were five, six and oh, and no one's talking about whether he's going to get out there and play anymore. He just did his job and he kept rolling straight through. I love him. I hope he is the next Joe Montana and Steve Young because he's playing that well. And he's he, and he has, to, you know, this beautiful professional, you know, demeanor about him. Let's hope he is our guy for here and there you know, <laughs> forevermore. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I do just to piggyback on what you said, that that's something else that um I feel like goes missed about Brock is um being able to be consistent is a skill. Yeah. It, it you know, being like that is a skill. Like being a pro isn't being able to run the four three. It's being able to run the four three when you're tired. It's being yeah. able to run the four three when you're hurt. It's being able to run the four three when you're not starting, when you're the backup. And being able to call on your skills at will is the true definition of a professional in any field. And nobody cares about you being sick. You need right. to log your ass on the teams and show up. Yeah. It's just, yeah. And one thing that I will say about Brock that you can, you can forecast that skill is if he's good, if he's elite at being consistent, then that means that if he gets better, he's going to be consistently better. Right. So that's something else that you can see with Brock that he's shown that whatever he can do, he could do it in spades. He can replicate it and keep doing it. And the availability of his skill set is what's more important to me than the actual skill, because the skill is enough. He can make the field. Right. But what's the point in having somebody that overshoots Brock's skill, big arm, can throw a country mile, big strapping kid can run forever, but we don't get the consistency. We don't get the availability. We don't get somebody that can do it on a day in and day out basis. Really? So that's something that you want out of Brock because you have a strong platform to to build off of. So you can take the marginal growth. You can take the upside of him getting marginally accurate, his processing, him getting better, him being able to get down out of the pocket and get on the field. And also one thing about Brock for being a smaller size athlete, he does a remarkable job at keeping himself healthy, especially when he gets outside of the pocket. So these are all things that we have seen from Brock, but this is one thing that you have to understand. This is on the backdrop of consistency. That's why he's here, right? Jimmy had good games. We've seen good Jimmy, but it just wasn't good Jimmy all the time. But we saw you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. The the <laughs> arsonist putting his own fire out, right? <laughs> yeah. And with Trey, we saw glimpses at best, but yeah. that consistency was short lived. So injury drugs him down, and and like you can't survive in this league with injuries. And you mm -hmm. know that's the sad part for Trey. Like we did mm -hmm. see glimpses, but you know that was it. it. Yeah, glimpses and glimpses don't pay the bills, right? They don't, they right? Don't, no love, no romance without money. finance. We right. got it. We we need you to actually give us something mm -hmm. consistent. So that's one thing that, again, sold me on Brock because it's just saying, look, the league is about process, mm -hmm. and if this kid can show Kyle 
the same thing every time. But the only difference in what he does is him actually getting a tick better. Then Kyle should be able to do everything he needs with this kid because we already went to the Super Bowl with Jimmy, and Jimmy was erratic at best. Look, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats, and that's how I feel about Brock. I love that. Right? Quote. I mean, like it, it literally is the truth. If, if if Brock Purdy gets better than every other player on the team, you see it with Tom Brady. Like when Tom Brady's on the field, you could have a, a subpar wide receiver. He's going to make him a superstar because this guy, if you catch the ball, you're automatically a superstar because Tom Brady is going to get the ball to you at some point. So I feel like Brock Purdy did that a lot. You know, he just is getting better. He's been improving and you saw it with his feet. Like everybody's like, oh, he's like kind of Steve Youngish. Look at him yeah. run. Like, you know, like people are surprised at what he's doing. And if you watch his Iowa tape, you saw him do a lot more of that, which, which is very college-esque. But mm -hmm. you can't always translate that to the NFL. You just – you don't take what you did in college and bring that to the NFL and be successful. But I do think that he's he's done it when he needed to in Joe Montana style, right? Like Joe Montana would stay in a pocket throw, but if Joe had to run, he would run. Steve Young would – he would totally run if he needed mm -hmm. to to make that, you know, make those plays, but you see it. You see him growing in his role in, in, in this last year. And I hope that, like, we keep Brandon Ayuk. That's his guy. We're not getting rid of Brandon Ayuk. That's just the, for, I don't know what you guys talked about before I got on with that, but I think Brandon Ayuk will be around for a while, which is it's good for Brock Purdy, too. Yeah. Ty, your thoughts? Brock's the guy. You know what? Screw Brock. Joshua Dobbs is going to push him for the job. <laughs> Joshua Dobbs is the smartest man in the NFL. And we all know that the biggest muscle in the body is the brain. So watch. Joshua Dobbs is going to come in and he's going to say, you know what? This may be Brockefeller Records, but I'm the CEO of Smart Row Records. And if you don't want the quarterback all up in your videos, dancing and pointing, and saying, looking, looking at me, come on over to Smart Row. Um, and if you don't know, now you know. <laughs> oh my God. There you go. I had to say something different. Brock Purdy <laughs> Love Fest. What the hell? No. No, what'd you say? Uh, John's gonna come in like, fuck Brock Purdy as a staff, a label, and we a crew. crew. That's right. <laughs> Down with Brock Purdy. <laughs> <Aaron and Aaron. laughs> Chino XL, FD. This no. both folk will make so all your kids. Yeah, right. Listen, <laughs> we're we not taking listen. back to the 90s. <laughs> wow. Listen. Oh, oh. Um, dirty, 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 diaper. I hate to sound like a broken record, but I am a broken record. We That's why I took I won't, your I playbook. Get That's right. Ready. <laughs> <laughs> Junior Brock. Mafia just just created their own tour in their head, like they're gonna go. That's to why Vegas I took your playbook, Brock. That's right. Yeah, it's be a tour coming on. Poconos. <laughs> We've seen Brock do nothing but ascend, do nothing get better and better as he's played. Coming in, coming off of a full year under his belt, he's fully healthy. Who have time to work out, work with receivers, work on himself, know this playbook even more, work with Kyle. He's just going to continue to do this, ascend, mm -hmm. and we will be better for it. So, it, it, you know, quarterback is the least of our problems for once in our lives. We're in a good place. And Brock, you know, just as your shirt says, Brock Kittle, 24. <laughs> I can see George coming back with a vengeance. He's got his guy. He's just happy. I remember that Lions game with George, George, the leader of the team, talking to him. That stuff resonates. Yeah. It's going to carry over to this season. So it's going to be good stuff. So no problems with Brock. Are you talking about shut the F up, George? No. When we were down at halftime and George was telling Brock, hey, you're the guy. I didn't like you're that. You're the moment. guy. Go out, lead them. Why not? Because I, I felt like George was telling Brock something that he already knew. 
And it I'm, looked like a moment. Sometimes, 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 sometimes if, no. if you know it, sometimes you just you need to hear it. Someone, yeah, you, and, you and, gotta and, understand. And I feel, George is a leader that, on this team, though, just like I, Fred Warner is. I, I feel and, that, and Eric Armstead time, is. I, I, I feel work. that. I, I I hear you, but at the same time, there is a difference between you tapping me and letting me know that, and you walking up to me on the sideline when I'm by myself, knowing that all of the cameras are going to be listening to the conversation that we're having right now. Screw it that. just seemed heavy handed. I don't know. Like, I don't know. George just seems contrived to me. He does. He comes off contrived. He's never that's, met an angle that he doesn't like. How does he always catch the true. good side? Like, true. Just, it's but. coincidental. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just, I don't know. He just seems a little WWE to me. And I, I, I get it, but call me crazy, but I'm a little old school. I was a lineman, right? So <laughs> I've never been on a football team where tight ends were stars. So for me... It just seems a little new age, to well, be you honest. You linemen, y'all different. Yeah, <laughs> we really are. You know what I'm saying? We're a salty bunch. But um, all I'm saying is, is that uh, you know, I understand where George is coming from. You know, he wanted to he wanted to like you know talk to Brock about getting the team together. But I think one of the best moments for me is when Brock was in the huddle and he looked at George and told him to shut the fuck up. I love that because that's for me, that means that, you know, as far as team dynamics are concerned, you're the guy you've been here longer than me. You're vested. You're a leader. I'm sure you love the team. And I get that. But when the bullets are flying, all right, and it's time for us to actually do our jobs, I'm going to need you to know that I'm running the show. And I just feel like that was emblematic of an element of our team that we didn't have even when Jimmy was here. And that's, I feel like that's football. Like, the, I understand that, you know, Brock is the quarterback and he may be young, he may be Mr. Irrelevant, but that's part of the reason why I was unsure about him because I wanted to know if he could fit the shoes, right? And that's what you want to see with a guy where it's like, all right, the draft stuff, that was cute. That's cool, but I'm the man now, all right? I'm the man. I'm the man in the room. It falls on me. I'm going to take accountability, but at the same time, I'm going to take the spoils of leadership too. So that means when I tell you to shut up when I'm trying to get the play out, shut up. I'm the man. And I feel like on teams that win, there's a man in the room. Simply put. Maddie, your thoughts? We're about ready to enter the great Brock Purdy era, right? Everything's going to be based around Brock Purdy. The roster is going to be built to facilitate Brock Purdy's success and or failure as the quarterback of this team. Okay. That's how it's going to be. This is the last year of the great traveling 49ers roadshow, just because of the way they got to set up the cap. You watched it with Buffalo and you watched it with a lot of these other teams. You're watching it with Dallas. Um, when these quarterbacks get start getting the, the large, the large cap number, you can't keep all the other guys on here. Uh, Brock's been a competitive advantage for the last two years because he's been able to coach up and play up uh, well beyond his pay grade. Um, and now we're getting ready to to get in to see really where he is, right? And there's a lot of quarterbacks that have gone on to get that second contract, right? Um, and some of them live up to it and some of them don't. You know, for every Patrick Mahomes, you know, there's a Daniel Jones, right? Or somebody like that that makes you go, oh, why did he do that? But here's the deal. We're getting a guy this year that actually gets to throw a football this off season, as opposed to snapping a towel on the sidelines. Okay. Um, they know his strengths. They know his weaknesses. They know what he can do. They know what he can't do. And they really know what they're going to need to do to help him. He's going to be the future of this team for the next five to six years, unless he completely falls off the map or gets hurt. So get ready for the Brock Purdy era because this is it. So this is, this is this is a big year. It's a big year for this franchise. It's a big year for him. Um, it's a big year for this draft class. Like, there's so much work that's got to be done still, and there's so many players that are still out there that are still difference makers. You know, teams are still out there getting better. Uh, the Rams got the guy that I wanted from Buffalo, right? They get Tre'Davious <laughs> White, right? Like, that's a. As soon as I saw that, what did I tell you guys? I said, if we don't sign him, he's going to sign with the Rams. What did he do? Sign Rams. If they don't sign with us, they sign with the Rams. That's what happens. That's just how it works, right? Um, so hopefully he doesn't end up biting us in the ass later. But 
Brock still going cooking. Xavier Howard's still out there, you know. I'm just saying, Xavier Howard's still out there, probably for a good price. And uh, hopefully they hit home runs in the draft because um, changes are afoot. And uh, that's yeah, the just money's how the coming. Is. The money's yeah. coming. All right. Before we get to that two minute warning, yes or no answer, Coach? Are we trading Brandon Ayuk? <sighs> Damn. That was a gut punch. Uh, <laughs> wow. I don't want to. Let's just say that. I do not want to. Uh all right. The time man. Okay, so the timeline, the timeline hurts because if if we can't <laughs> if we can't get a deal done, we're we're gonna probably trade him by the draft. Kind of trade them draft day probably. Um, if that happens, that's not completely the end of the world. We could trade up and get our tackle. The draft could look really good with that compensation, depending on what we get for BA. Um, I know I would just be surprised if we get a deal done. BA seems really entrenched in making sure he gets its market value. And that's at, at a floor of $25 million a year. Um, I think the Niners are probably looking at $25 million as like the ceiling um, of how they want to deal with BA. Um, so uh, they're probably looking at BA to probably come down maybe a million or two per year. And I don't think that BA is necessarily going to come off of that. He's really cornering himself with all of this rhetoric. He's kind of going to have these. He made spider cut off his nose to spite his face because mm -hmm. really what the Niners could possibly do is they could say, they could just balk and say, you know what, we're not going to move at all. We're going to draft, and we may even draft your replacement right in front of you yeah. and make you play this year. And next year, just for kicks, just for shits and giggles, we'll franchise you. And then lock in your market value at $4 million worth less than what your floor is now. So you really want to play ball, you know, so the Niners could really the Niners could really play hardball with B.A. if they wanted to. It would all but ruin it would all but ruin his uh, relationship with us. But I say, I say we keep him. We keep him. We're going to get a deal done. We're going to have a really expensive wide receiver room, but. Um, who knows? We may get a restructure from Debo, possibly a surprise restructure that we may not see coming. But Doubt it. Debo, Debo's due to make twenty eight million dollars this year. Um, Jawan is locked in. We're, we're thankful to get him at the four million that we did mm -hmm. um, at his price tag. And quite frankly, he's underpaid for even for the four million that we got him for. Yeah. This will be so, the last year of him. I can yeah. assure you of that. Yeah. Hell yeah. So right now. Can we stomach damn near sixty million dollars for our wide receiver core just in three receivers alone? Uh, money tells me no, right? If we just go off budget alone, but I feel like they're going to try to do it because it's just what we've done. We we've kind of shown that we don't necessarily prioritize the offensive line at least fiscally, and. The money that we've put in our offense has always been in our skill players. And B.A. is a um, – he's not only a vested piece, but he's an equity piece. We put a lot into him. That's why I don't want to lose him. It's not like we got some hired gun who just came here ready to – he wasn't a plug-and-play player. Like, he got better here. You know what I'm saying? And because of the equity that we have in him, I just think that the Niners are going to play ball. Um, they well, I hope that they meet each other in the middle. So I'm gonna give the I'm gonna give the optimistic pick. I'm gonna say that we're gonna keep them. Um, and because of the equity and because BA got drafted here, and they may be able to come to a resolution and meet each other in the middle. My only thing is is that uh I just I feel like one of the reasons why BA is posturing as much as he is in the media is because he already knows that he's not the number one option on this team not only not the number two or three option on this offense and he just wants to have a little he just wants to 
kind of have a little bit of public opinion behind his back, kind of some wind at his sails when he goes into negotiations where it's like, hey, man, everybody kind of knows who I am. I've kind of chirped at Pittsburgh. I kind of made a little, I batted my ass at Houston. Like, come on, guys. Like, and really what it is is kind of just like when your lady is just, she just wants some attention. She doesn't want to go anywhere, but she just wants you to just, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, don't be nonchalant. Chalant me. That's all I want. I just want some little shalanting. So I feel like B.A., he wants to be wind and dine a little bit. He wants to kind of feel like he's not just a cog in um, in, a, in an already put together um, offense. And then also, really what he wants to do is something that I feel like is one of the reasons why we lost Eric Armstead is he doesn't want to end up giving us a hometown discount. But then on the back end, it locks in his market value across the league. And he can't go out across in free agency and say, I'm not really worth $24 million. The year I got paid with the Niners, I was really worth 26, but I gave them a break. And nah, that doesn't play. The balance sheet says that you're a $24 million a year player. So um, it's nuanced, but I think they'll find a way. Yeah, I agree. I think we keep BA. Ty, what do you think? Uh, yeah, we keep him. It's, it's a no-brainer. It's like Coach said, you invested so much into him. He's your number one wide receiver. Um, simply for the growth of your young quarterback, who you've been praising for the past year and a half, mm -hmm. you need him out there. You want him out there, mm -hmm. right? And you see what happens when B.A. all of a sudden becomes your focal point in the offense. If people just put on the Bucks game. Um, it's a no brainer. I think they, they can definitely do it. I think the money's there. Um, remember his cap number will go down this year. If they extend them, then you got the numbers next year. Who knows if Trent comes back, but there's a way to make the numbers work and they can do that. So he'll definitely be back this year just for the simple fact is they want to make another run at their Super Bowl and having a Brandon Ayuk on the field. Is going to help make that happen. Becca, hundred percent. Pour some sugar on me. Like, I mean, that is that is what VA is out there singing oh, out loud. Hey. Oh yeah. Oh, that sugar right on me because somebody <laughs> needs to pay me. I'm the sweet spot for your quarterback. That is what you. That is what we have. These two have, have they they have the synergy. They they practice together so long, you know, behind the scenes. When he wasn't the QB or uh, wide receiver one, you know, uh, and so you got this guy that that gels so well with your your QB. You, you can't let this guy go. He's just not going anywhere. And of course, he's going to chirp. Of course, he's going to posture and and want to make a scene. Nick Bosa held out, and you know the Bear posted. Uh, all of them do it. George Kittle. With, Debo unfollowed the team. I mean, Debo yeah, they all do it. exactly. They all get emotional. Well, it is now these things on social media. But these I mean, kids right. love to express themselves through social media. Right, and they it's get their all, public all diary. Emotional, right, like emo emoji, the emojis, emotional. <laughs> emoji, <laughs> emotional, and and they all do it. So I love like George Kittle. You know, he he responded in full emoji as well. I was like, look, they, they all do it. They understand it. it it's. It's their contract year. Is Brandon going to come back and fall off like all these guys have done? I hope not. Like, my God, understand it's a contract year. But please, for your sake and everyone else's, don't stop showing up for practice and stop putting in the work and, and show up, like, unprepared. Like, that's my only concern about BA is, is you think he's going to hold out? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like they all do. Like they don't show up for practice. They don't practice in the off season, and then they show up. They're out of shape. They're out of overweight. They're you know they're just not prepared. They haven't seen the playbook, and then it takes them half the season to get into the swing of things. So I on hope one hand, work. on one hand, I will say that that's not BA because if you if you've solid. noticed, BA is not only is BA very very hardcore as far as being prepared is concerned but he's made that's another reason why i really want to pay attention to this because i want to sign him ba has become such a leader 
he is always if you've noticed he's been here he's he's one of the only veterans that's here for rookie mini camp he's there for otas he's there for all of the all season stuff well before all of the guys get in there so if he's not there for that stuff that would be something that you would notice that you don't want to see so i agree with you oh, rebecca two words nick bosa who mm-hmm. self-admitted that his own contract negotiations derailed his entire off-season protocol. And Devo, the year before. Camp. I mean, yeah. like, they all do it. And it, it's sa- self-sabotage in those in those situations. Like, you got the, the, the defensive player of the year coming off of his contract year, not showing up, and then he's miles behind everyone. And it takes him half the season to get into – Football shape and into playbook shape. Rebecca, so that was on Coach Wilkes. Give Nick Bosa a break. Yeah, right. that was on Coach Wilkes. Yeah, I mean, that was on Coach Wilkes. All right. I mean, no self, I no think we already had this segment. That was on Coach Wilkes. <laughs> and if BA comes in out of shape, that's on Coach Wilkes. That's on Coach Wilkes again. If BA comes yeah, in out yeah. of shape, we're finding Coach, Coach Wilkes, Wilkes and man. stringing well, him in here Coach for Wilkes a tribunal. Is the Un- the unacceptable. You heard it here first. <laughs> he needs to get I'm off the sideline and onto the field. I had to get you. I'm sorry. I had to get you. <laughs> That's hilarious. No, but you know what I mean. Like, I hope that yeah. doesn't happen. I hope they work something out well in advance because we don't want BA coming to camp late. We don't want him like missing out on, on all the preseason games and not being ready for the season because there's some sort of contract lingering thing, which we've seen play out with Debo. We've seen that play out with Bosa and, and, and others where then they show up, they're overweight, out of shape and, and out of sync with the playbook and they don't have a clue what's happening and and it doesn't translate well. Anyway, I think we're keeping BA. I, it, we just are. Yeah. Maddie. We're keeping BA because the reason he's not signed now is because Eric Armstead's $18 million doesn't hit the salary cap until after June 1st. So that's why Braden yeah. Ayuk hasn't been signed yet. He'll get signed in June. The only other thing I could see that might possibly happen is after June 1st, um, Debo becomes a $22 million potential cap savings if there's any sort of train or something like that done afterwards, which All might right. be something they try to set up for next season or not. So keep an eye on that after June 1st because they might start getting a little bit creative with that. But I think at the end of the day, this is not only built for now, but it's also built for later to kind of go into the great Brock era. And I think they know that Brock is going to need B.A. to be successful in the next level. Because if you're going to build this team around your quarterback, you need to make sure that he has a number one receiver. And if you throw him out, like, who are you going to get, right? And B.A. is a true number one receiver. So uh, if it's B.P. to B.A., which is going to be the thing, yeah, I I don't see him being traded at all. Unless he is absolutely so impatient, he can't wait till after June first. He wants to be traded now, and he wants to go to a team so that he can get his contract immediately. And he becomes so unbelievably outlandish and ridiculous that they have no choice but to do anything else. But I can't imagine him doing that. He's just trying yeah. to keep them on the front burner right now and just like keep this thing talking. Right? Every week we're going to be talking about BA getting paid, BA getting paid, BA getting paid. Well, they can't do this stupid crap like they did with Nick Bosa last year. Like, figure out what the market is and go from there. Um, but as soon as that money's available from Eric Armstead, get this taken care of and get it done um, and, and take care of it for him, take care of it for this franchise, and take care of it for Brock Purdy. Well put. All right. So with that being said, let's go to our hurry up offense in the two minute warning. Boom. Go ahead, Ty. Yeah, hey, screw Brock Purdy. No, let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> And Steve Wilkes, too. <laughs> and Steve Wilkes, too. Uh, Coach, man, thanks for jumping on. This was great. The chat was popping tonight. You you guys were great. Um, the offseason is just getting started. So just just <laughs> have some fun. Keep enjoying this. It makes for great conversation. And come on back and join us on East Coast Red and Gold every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Coach, thanks for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, shout out to the chat. You guys were awesome. Um, enjoy the off season, faithful. As always, go Niners. Yeah, Becca. Thanks for everyone in the chat. Uh, welcome to all the new Niners. You know, all these new guys that are joining the team. I hope you know we we, we see some great things. I think we've got a great cast of characters that 
we've signed so far and uh, looking forward to talking about more Niners stuff as the, the season rolls on. So go Niners. And thanks, Coach, for some good uh, back and forth there. <laughs> I'm always a good devil's advocate. Coach, go ahead. Closing thoughts. Oh, no, I loved it. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. I love the conversation. Everybody has a different point of view, which I love. It's not a lot of group think, which I've been on shows where there has been, quite frankly. So it's good that you guys all have your own points of view. And it's inclusive. So there's enough room for us to rub up against each other. <laughs> a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of a confession. Sometimes I sometimes I like to knock things around a little bit just to see how you guys can handle it. So you guys did really well. It's good. So I had a good time. And I'm, I mean, easy. I'd love to come back if you would have me. I had a great time, guys. And thank you again oh, yeah. to the chat and the fans. Yeah, Maddie. Um, boy, I had like a million things to say and to like talk about. Um, but at the end of the day like can the season friggin get here already like i, I know, am right? dying every day <laughs> it's like we, we oh we got this coaches meeting and we got this this thing and we've got this that the thing meeting. Meeting. Ah. let's go let's get to the draft let's get some things moving let's get some stuff going also some wise guy once said that maybe you should sign cordero patterson once they changed the kickoff rules and you were late again oh Please. You are so God, listen to me. about that. Listen, listen, listen to the old man. He's watched a few things. I'm telling you, John, the like consulting services are free. Okay. I've told you this a million times. Cordero Patterson should have been signed immediately upon that announcement. So let's go. Let's fix the special teams. That's one thing that we can all hang our hat on. This special teams has got to be fixed. Like, get straight, get That's right. You should have been pointing game. your finger at. That. <laughs> That's what needs some consistency as well. Can we right just hire game. that guy this year? I don't even get me started. Two years That's ago. a whole other show. Two years okay. ago. Is Not enough consistency. Where is Matt? Wherever he is. Great show, guys. Great show. See you. I know where next Jess is. Back next week. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, it's that way, right? Matt's up there. That way. That way something. Here's a story. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find a video. I'm sorry. Have a good night, y'all. And of course, for the upstart 49ers, they're six yards away from Pontiac. Third and three. We'll see a pickup sometime on the right side, possibly. Montana looking, looking, throwing in the end zone.